Hello and welcome to the Learning to Slay the Beast podcast, a resilience podcast where we talk about all the challenging things that we're working to overcome like anxiety, health and relationship issues. My name is Sarah. Hello and welcome to the Learning to Slay the Beast podcast. My name is Sarah and I'm happy to connect with you this week. I have decided to end the year with a best of 2022 session. I'm going to go through and put together some different clips from throughout the year so that it'll really give you a sample of some of the episodes that you may have missed and hopefully you'll go back to them if there's something that rings true. Um, And I've also tried to steal some of the really key tidbits and put those into this 2022 best of or wrapped or whatever you want to call it. I know Spotify does a nice um, end of the year thing that everybody loves and I've seen them on on different platforms as well and lots of podcasts do this. I did one last year and I actually did it in two parts. I think this year I'm going to try to just get it in one. It might be a really long episode but we'll just put it all together and you can listen and come back to it whenever you get a chance and just hopefully enjoy um, looking back at the 2022 year. It was a great year on the podcast. I had a few times where I took a little bit of time off which I've never done before so I thought that was kind of fun. I decided also to reflect a little bit on the podcast in general and look into what episodes have been downloaded the most over the last year. And so I've put together a top 10. So not all of these actually were published this year, but these were the episodes that were downloaded the most between December of last year and the end of November this year. So number 10 was episode 105, How to Journey Beyond Divorce with Karen McMahon. That was number 10. Number nine was How to Recognize If Your Teen Needs Help with Amy Schaefer Post. That was episode 118. And those two were both done this year, so I thought that was great. Next, we had How to Deal with Awkward Situations with Paula Jean Ferry. That is episode 97. Then we had episode 89, Break the Mold with Dr. Jill Krista. Then episode 117 of How to Love Food and Fitness in That Order with Sam Guaz, which was from May of 2022, so another episode from this year. Then we had episode 88, Brain Inflamed with Dr. Ken Bach. That was from late in 2021. Another episode from 2021, which was episode number 65, Homeopathic Treatment of Pandas and Pans with Dr. Jennifer Baer. Episode 114, How to Parent a Highly Sensitive Child with Melissa Schwartz. And again, that one was from this year. So really great great to see it up at number three. And then episode 103, Supporting Pandas and Pans and Chronic Illness Naturally with Erin Darling. That was from January of 2022. So that was number two. And the number one episode downloaded still this year, which was from 2021, is episode 87, I Am Not Alone, Pandas Pans Awareness Day with Gabriella True. Honestly, thank you so much to everybody that was involved in the podcast this year and all the years. Really great to have so many wonderful listeners and so many great people to interview and speak to. And I really hope to be able to continue this throughout 2023 and keep getting uh, good quality interviews and exciting, interesting things out there into the world. So again, thank you so much for listening and enjoy this wrap up of 2022. Episode 101. How to Heal Your Inner Child with Mishka Siebert. The thing for breathing is to bring presence to body. Because uh, there are multiple trauma responses. Even procrastination is a trauma response because they're trying to avoid certain things, <laughs> which is, I am very good at this sometimes. <laughs> so I can yeah. already identify this. But uh, because it's just like, oh, so much responsibility. It's like it's heavy, right? So yes, my body yes. is just feeling like, oh, can't. Oh, it's overwhelming. Like all this when you feel overwhelmed, that's also like that something you're carrying, even from your parents and as children, we were carrying even problems and, and that emotions from our parents. So there is like also generational clearing. So you actually realize that many thoughts and feelings and emotions that you feel 
and their behaviors are not yours are not even maybe your mother's can be from your great grandma this is what i realized in my family lineage that i repeated the behavior of my great grandma that my great grandma was took on and then she taught my mom and my mom taught me oh, so wow. it's like you can literally like break free from these things when you bring that awareness because when you bring that awareness you bring the change so many times when people like to do this work it's also be like okay so where to start right it's like if you imagine it's like oh my god so who whose trauma am i carrying actually it can be like our realm but um the thing that i always start with is like okay what so start start kind of breathing into your body put your hands on the on the body part that you feel some tension some resistance some emotion something you feel something there and when you put your hands on this place and start deeply breathing but when you bring them out make a sound and some women have resistance to this and so when i would do sessions i'm like encouraging to do this the reason why because many women have and i had this as well have like trauma from speaking up so not using our voice to say yes to say no to to speak our needs we sacrifice ourselves for the sake of others for family and so on so to use our voice it's actually an activating it it's healing and recovering from the trauma so that's why also breathing out and making sound it's it's how we release that also so it might sound really weird and and be like that but you literally like breathing into this part like <sighs> i also when you do this you relax your shoulders you relax more in your body and you're more present in your body and the reason why it's important to be present in our body is because trauma many times causes the fact that as children we we do this escaping like we escape to different modalities different things we escape because we don't want to see things we don't want to face those emotions so we humans do that like go on a phone scroll instagram go on netflix we all have different types of escapism um but when we are actually present with ourselves we sure we don't abandon ourselves we don't abandon those parts that want to be heard and seen so this is really really beautiful and deep work and the reason why i do inner child work is cuz we go to the root you go to the core to the source of that pain and when you release it you you actually you don't do surface stuff you go to the dose to those roots and you dig it out and you can blossom as a flower then because the soil is healthy. Episode 102, how to make classrooms more inclusive with DJ Nicholson. You know, what we expect from children at school versus what we see out in the workplace. But can you imagine if children had a chance to choose their own spot? Obviously there are parameters around where you can sit. You can't sit on the desk or on the radiator or things yeah. like that. But hey, can you hey. imagine? Right. But can you imagine if we gave children a, an opportunity to, you know, when they start getting wiggly, that they can go sit someplace else rather than it becoming a behavioral issue? Because yeah. we see that all the time. It becomes a behavior issue and it doesn't have to be. I feel like when you, when you know your when you know your students and you have tools and, and alternate ways to look at things, it's much more effective and and like i said it gives kids ownership it leaves them feeling empowered and then it's hopefully it'll cut down on behavior yeah and then i do see that it really does need to become a whole school approach because one of the things i've seen is that the children will maybe be like for example in a grade 3 class where they have this approach and they're able to move around and you know they have different seats and things like that but then they go to the next classroom in grade 4 and it's not like that. It's, you know, totally the standard desk situation that yes. every time you need to stand up, like I see that that could be very jarring for kids where you're like, but I, I can't do what it was comfortable. It's all changed. And, um, right. yeah. So I see where then yeah. it needs to lend itself to a school wide approach really. Well, and you know, I've said, I've said to teachers, you know, I, I have worked with, with quite a few teachers that were a little rigid and really weren't open to some new ways of thinking. But sometimes if I just, you know, say to them, you know, what is, what's your end result? 
What do you what do you want to have happen here? Do you want him to sit in that chair for 45 minutes or do you want him to really dig deeper into the solar system? Which is it? Because right now, you know, you're you're fighting the fight about the chair. <laughs> let him sit on the floor. If he can focus better on the floor, let him sit on the floor. If he needs to stand up. I mean, we we can't we have to get to a point where we're not judging children for being focused and attentive because they look at us. We, we, it's, it's such a different, a different world now where, you know, we just, we have to move away from the traditional school setting where all the desks are in a row and everyone is looking at the teacher and everybody is doing things exactly the same way. That's not how our kids are. Episode 103, Supporting Pandas, Pans, and Chronic Illness Naturally with Erin Darling. Yeah. So even though I no longer call myself a nutritionist, I absolutely use the power of nutrition. I believe it can be such a helpful tool. Um, I use the power of supplements, nutraceuticals, herbs, homeopathy, uh, lifestyle practices are huge. And I also outsource. I really rely on referrals to like a tight knit uh, network so that we can create the layered approach that's required uh, to have the most impact. So for instance, I love chiropractic care. I love of FSM, which is frequency specific microcurrent therapy. I love neurofeedback. I love trauma therapy, all of these things that really allow the nutritional, supplemental and lifestyle uh, practices to take hold and really have that profound effect. Okay, great. I haven't heard of FSM. That's interesting. I'm writing that one down myself. I totally agree on the layered approach. Like I've often talked on the podcast about, um, you know, kind of assembling the team of experts that you really need because yeah, it isn't just just one person for sure um, with this with this challenging disorder. So that's great. Oh, totally. Like sometimes my work starts with nutrition. Sometimes it ends with nutrition. Sometimes it's the primary focus. And sometimes we don't even really touch on it at all. I really uh, believe it's important to be flexible, meet people where they are and and figure out um, how to layer these things as it all unfolds. And as a nutritionist, when I, when I was kind of identifying as a nutritionist, and that was my primary area of work, I wasn't able to do this. I would identify, you know, traumas and, and nervous nervous system imbalance and all of these things, but I, I had to use nutrition and it just, it didn't always work. Yeah, no, I can totally understand that. And sometimes maybe the client's already done a certain amount of that work. And so then it can, it's not maybe making as big of a difference as, as what you'd like to see or what, um, what they kind of need to keep moving forward. Any practical tips on the nutrition side. I mean, I've shared on the podcast that we've had some recommendations about incorporating more, more like fish and vegetables in the morning, trying to heal my son's gut. And, you know, I'm not, I'm not seeing a huge difference, but I'm definitely seeing the refusal piece um, in terms of my, you know, my son's getting older. He's less amenable to some of the things that, that we're working mm. um, and even vitamins. Like, you know, I've, I've talked about this as well, but, you know, been doing vitamin drinks and things like that for years, um, concoctions of all the things that are are being recommended. And, you know, there are some mornings where they're just like, no, I don't want this um, and things like that. Like, do you have any practical tips on how to get um, children on board when you are trying to make some of those challenging changes? Oh, absolutely. I feel like I could answer this question forever. We can have our, our own podcast on this question. Um, there's so many ways to look at this. I try not to be too dogmatic in my approach um, in terms of summarizing into practical tips that can get really tricky because I love to emphasize an individualized approach to care uh, mm -hmm. based on things like functional lab testing and assessment. So I don't like to ask um, you know families to super restrict if it's not absolutely necessary. And even when I do, it's for a really short period of time because I really emphasize trauma in my practice and sort of unconscious um 
mechanisms, essentially. So food restriction can be really, really hard on a young person's psyche. And, yeah. you know, I really believe in listening to our kids and following their intuition as well. So when a child doesn't want to take a supplement, I am diving deeper into that. Why? Why is that happening? Is this, you know, a, a battle between control of parent and child? Or is it, you know, just the fact that the body doesn't want this or doesn't need it? But even mm -hmm. though it says on paper that this might be the right thing, uh, I really believe that kids are mega intuitive, especially our picky eaters. This is an area that I love uh, working with because picky eaters often have so many messages for us about what's happening in their system based on what they will eat and what they won't. Episode 104, how to be pain-free with Fran Garden. When you're eating something that's inflammatory, your body is fighting against it, Okay because it's not healthy for it. So your, your immune system and all the, 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 the blood cells and everything are trying to get rid of this toxin in your body, basically. And so that causes inflammation because inflammation, you have to remember inflammation is a good thing in a way because it, it tells your body that something is happening that shouldn't be happening. There's something within your system that shouldn't be there. And basically the immune system turns on white blood cells come, they surround the area. Maybe you get like a red swollen area. If you, if you've banged your hand or you, you um, it gets hot, right? So that's a kind of inflammation, but the body's trying to heal itself. It's protecting that area so that it can start to heal. But when we're constantly eating foods that are inflammatory, so I'm going to talk about the furious five. They're the big five ones, gluten, dairy, sugar, soy, and corn. Those are the big five inflammatory foods. And the more you eat them, the more they affect your gut health and the intestinal wall line, the, the stomach, you know, as you go to the bathroom, how, how, <laughs> I hope this is okay to say this on your show. Like, how is it when you go to the bathroom? How's your poop? Like, that's an important thing. And people kind of forget about that. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, so what's going on in your system internally um, affects your body and the amount of pain and inflammation that you have. But imagine if I'm eating, let's say I'm eating gluten and every day I'm eating gluten. Well, it takes the average person four days to digest gluten. And that's if you don't have an intolerance to it. So if I eat something on Monday, I'm still digesting it on Thursday, but I ate gluten Tuesday, Wednesday and Thursday. So it just kind of compounds itself. So your body's in a constant state of inflammation, if that makes sense. Yeah, it does. It does for sure. And and that's something that I was experiencing. And I um, am, am gluten and dairy free. Um, yep. And I find those to be really key key issues for me. So yeah, it totally yeah. makes sense. And, and that's very similar with autoimmune conditions yes. um, as well. Yes. And um, Sorry, I just want to add to that, Sarah. Yeah, I just want to add, like, when it comes to, like, the structural part of the body, so our body is made up of fascia. So all the connective tissue in the body that surrounds the muscles, the cells, the muscle fibers. And basically, like, if I'm moving my hands, that ability to move the, the hand and to bend and stretch and, and do all the things that the muscles are supposed to do, it it I have that ability because the fascia is healthy. There's a lot of blood flow going to that area. But... If I'm, and, and fascia should slide, okay, against, as the muscle fibers move, it slides and the muscles move freely. But if I eat food that's inflammatory and sugar is one of the big ones that really affects fascia, the, the fascia becomes like Velcro and it sticks together and then it gets less blood flow. And then when I try to move, I have a pain because I'm trying to move a muscle or a muscle fiber in a particular way, but it's. It, it can't because it's stuck. There's too much inflammation there. So then I have pain in my body. So that's another thing to consider when we're talking about the pain and body and the body is that your fascia needs to really be healthy. So my number one piece of advice for that is please foam roll your body <laughs> because foam rolling gives blood flow to the muscles. And um, it's really, really important to keep the fascia healthy. It, it, and I mean, of course, changing the things that you eat, of course, as you well know, right, um, makes a huge difference in how your body feels. 
Yeah, absolutely. And and I do find sugar to be probably the more challenging of those just because it is in so many spots. And then we've got all these holidays that seem yes. to focus on sugar. And yeah. so, yeah, I can totally see that. Um, so foam rolling, is there like a certain area we should work on or? Whichever area is hurt. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Like don't. So, so I would say the biggest thing, don't roll over. Don't do the back of the knees. There's a lot of things going on in the back of the knees. So please avoid that. Don't do the low back because that's where all the organs are. So, so remember foam rolling brings blood flow to an area. So we don't want to bring more blood flow to the organs, right? So we want to be mindful of that. And we wouldn't roll the neck or the head. Um, because again, there's a lot of things going there and we're bringing blood flow. We don't want blood to go up to the brain there. And, and cause it can be, um, intense, um, if, especially if you've never done it before, but it is a fantastic modality that anybody like anybody can use. I use it, my seniors foam roll. So mm -hmm. it doesn't, it, and it's simple to do. Um, so I strongly encourage that just to keep the fascia healthy and, and moving and, and getting blood flow in there. And it helps with inflammation as well. There's so many benefits. I, I could do a workshop for you on Sarah Fulmer on Foam I I'm a huge proponent of it. Episode 105, How to Journey Beyond Divorce with Karen McMahon. When we fall in love, we're not just falling in love with the individual. On, on a subconscious level, we're falling in love with something that's very familiar. I was just actually speaking to a neuroscientist for my podcast and she talked about how the brain does this. And so you may have come from a family with uh, alcoholism, addiction, uh, infidelity, um, uh, rage, uh, 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 the silent treatment. And very often we marry a version of our parents and in the beginning, there's the honeymoon stage and everything's beautiful and wonderful. And then uh, kids come, finances come, less time comes, like all the stresses. And so often our clients find that they have been almost living a blueprint of some variation in the dance of the husband and the wife or the partner and the partner as the case may be. Um, and so the wounds of the childhood are, if I come from a household, like I came from a household, my dad was an alcoholic, a jolly one, but an alcoholic. My mom was a codependent and a rageaholic. And when I looked in the mirror with a two and four and a half year old, I saw my codependent rageaholic self looking back at me. And I was like, holy shit. Um, I got to do something about this. I've just become, I have become a person that I don't like, and it's very familiar. And I could talk about what I saw in my spouse with my parents and, and vice versa. And so wounds of the childhood really do play a part because our first intimate relationship is with our mom and our dad and our siblings and whatever that interplay is, when we go out and we fall in love, we meet people whose family of origin interplay, they, they connect like puzzle pieces. And in a healthy relationship and a safe relationship, when those wounds come to the surface, you love each other and you support each other and you give each other, the, you hold the space to heal and refine that happens in healthy relationships with a certain level of emotional intelligence. Um, I didn't have that level of emotional intelligence. I was not nearly as aware of all of that. And so uh, in many marriages, you end up having this kind of blame and accusation, these um, emotional grenades that get tossed across the room and you're not so compassionate anymore. And you see a lot of faults in the other person and, and things can really fall apart. Episode 106, How to Breathe Like a Badass with Hannah Jane Thompson. It's literally whatever you have time for. Most of the clients that I work with are people that have meditated at least a little bit on their own. Um, so most of the meditations that I give my clients are between 15 and 20 minutes long. But I would say if you're just beginning, literally there's no right answer. Meditate for as long as you have. Uh, even three good,
deep breaths where you're paying attention to the inhale and the exhale for three full breaths. I mean, that's already amazing for somebody that's never meditated before. Um, objectively, most of the science that has been done on meditation. So you mentioned the MBSR. That's mm -hmm. one of the eight week courses that is often used as a scientific benchmark for people that have kind of learned to meditate in quotes. Um, most of those courses do recommend at least 20 minutes a day. Um, but for mindfulness meditation, there's not kind of like a specific time that you must do it for. I mean, there are other types of meditation, such as TM, transcendental meditation, where they say 20 minutes twice a day, I think, or it might even be longer than that, but that's not my specialty. But what I would say is that mindfulness meditation really is about finding what works for you. And so if five minutes seems manageable to you, do five minutes. Sit, literally set a timer on your phone for five minutes and just focus on your breath as much as you can for five minutes or find a YouTube meditation or one of mine on insight timer. No, <laughs> like <laughs> shameless plug, shameless plug. But um, yeah, so I would say do not heap more pressure on yourself to do more than is manageable for you. I am a meditation teacher and some days I literally do 10 minutes because, you know, life is busy. Like I have a puppy, mm -hmm. I have to give him breakfast and I have to like go to the supermarket and I have to like work out and do some work. And you know, I don't have time to like sit there all day being like, I am a Zen monk, like meditating all day. You know, I'd love to, but I also have a life. So you have to make it fit in with your life in order for it to be sustainable and for you to get consistent long-term results. However, like I say, most scientific studies work on the basis of the fact that you'll get the most results, the best results, if you do at least 20 to 30 minutes a day. But you can work up to that. Like you don't have to start doing 20 or 30 minutes a day because that's just too much for a lot of people. Yeah, that makes sense. And I think that's where we started with maybe five or 10 because it was just starting to train yourself. And do you think that there is a kind of different quality to meditation, like whether you're doing a guided meditation versus say doing one where you're just sitting in a chair and closing your eyes and focusing on breath. Like, do you get a different benefit from different types or which do you recommend? Well, like I say, I recommend whatever works for you, but I, I get mm -hmm. that that's an annoying answer. Cause it's like, yeah, great Hannah, but what does that actually mean for me? <laughs> but I mean, I would say that, um, the goal is not necessarily to get rid of all guided meditations. I think a lot of people think that guided meditations are kind of for beginners. And then what they eventually want to do is do it without anything and just do it themselves. And that, that can be helpful. Um, being able to sit with yourself by yourself with no guidance whatsoever is amazing if you can, but a lot of people can't do that. A lot of people mm -hmm. need the guidedness. Um, in order to kind of get to that space of focus. Um, I would also say that guided meditations can be very helpful because there's as many different meditations as there are meditation teachers. And one technique that works for one person might not work for you and vice versa. Um and also quite often when we're in a space where we could benefit from meditation, you know, if we're feeling really stressed or really caught up in our own thoughts, sometimes having somebody else talk to us or having outside guidance or just a fresh voice or like a fresh perspective from a guided meditation on an app or YouTube or whatever mm -hmm. can actually help us to kind of get out of ourselves and interrupt the cycle of anxious thoughts or whatever we're dealing with. Um, so I would say that actually finding an app or a teacher like me or a YouTube channel um, that you like um, can actually be really, really helpful. And it doesn't mean that you're kind of cheating or doing it wrong. <laughs> Episode 108, How to Beat Burnout with Dr. Pooja Agarwal, MD. So what, what you can do is actually, first of all, recognizing that you are in this chronic loop of stress. Oftentimes we just feel like we, this is normal, like always being stressed or being overwhelmed, not sleeping, but first of all, recognizing that there is a problem. Mm -hmm. And you can recognize that by, first of all, realizing how much sleep are you getting? Some of us think it's normal to get, you know, three or four hours of sleep and to function on that. That's not normal. 
Mm-hmm. Um, so, and then two, realizing how much are you taking care of yourself or how much are you not taking care of yourself? Are you exercising? Are you eating healthy? Um, and how much are you actually taking care of yourself? And giving yourself that time to be alone, you know, even if it's 15 minutes a day, looking at your life and reflecting on it. And then mm-hmm. realizing how are you showing up in your life? Are you always stressed? Are you always worried? Anxious? I mean, how are other people, uh, how are you projecting yourself to other people? And, you know, how are your relationships? Are you, you know, irritable at home? Are you not? You know, how are, you know, what are you feeling? Really recognizing those different things and realizing that you have stress or overwhelm or burnout, whatever you want to call it. And what you can do to actually get help is you can, for some people, they may require a thing like a physician or a counselor. And those people are people who are turning to alcohol or, to, you know, drugs to help with that burnout or the overwhelm. That's definitely something that coach would not help help you with this much. That's, you definitely need to see a counselor or a physician for that. And, um, you know, some people, though, are, have, don't have burnout, aren't turning to those different things. And they are realizing that they have burnout or overwhelm or stress, and then they can get a coach. A coach can really help you realize what are your priorities in life. And again, this is something that I do. You know, who are you? What do you want out of life? You know, what are your priorities? A lot of us give so much to our work, and then mm-hmm. we don't have, we feel empty. We don't have a, as much to give. But, you know, realizing that, you know, work is always going to be there. And if you don't put yourself first, you're really just hurting yourself. And so reaching out for that help, realizing that you are not alone, and that burnout is something that a lot of people experience. So it's first of all, recognizing it and then reaching out for help. Episode 110, how to promote gut health with Projecta Apte. Most of us know that uh, gut problems they do not start overnight this is a process it's a slow process and by the time person realize that he or she is dealing with different symptoms uh, the damage is happened unfortunately and uh, it could have been that there is something simmering underneath the surface for uh, many months prior to that many years sometimes prior to that so um, that this is a process it doesn't happen overnight and there are a lot of um, reasons that are uh, associated with the gut problems or your symptoms that you are struggling with uh, we talk about poor diet, which is a major thing. And poor diet is uh, the food choices that you are making, processed food, the food that is low in fiber, high in bad quality fat and uh, processed carbohydrates loaded with sugar. That's a bad recipe for your gut health. Excessive use of antibiotics. And again, I'm I'm not against antibiotics, but um, in our in our country, a lot of times antibiotics are used in excessive amounts, and antibiotics play a role, a huge role in uh, getting rid of the infection. But at the same time, it takes out, it sweep away all the good friendly bacteria from your gut. So excessive use of antibiotic definitely is a major, one of the major reasons for you to have a poor gut health. Lack of physical activity, so sedentary lifestyle, ongoing stress. These days, everyone is under stress. And if you are not able to manage your stress correctly, if you're not practicing some stress management practices daily on a daily basis that stress can also negatively impact your gut health severe toxin exposure is another major contributing factor and that source of toxins can be from everywhere environmental toxins um, toxins from your food toxins from the poor quality air that we inhale for quality water um, even cleaning products personal care products everything can possibly increase the toxicity in our body and when your toxic load continues to be high it is going to affect your gut health so that is definitely a major reason for a lot of people to have a imbalanced gut the other um, One of the major cause for poor gut health is poor sleep, whether it's a quality of sleep or the uh, quantity of sleep. And when people are not getting enough sleep, 
um, less than seven hours, pretty much every night, that is going to impact their gut health. Episode 112, How to Parent Through Health Challenges with Helen Wills. So I wondered if you could kind of talk a little bit about the impact on you as a caregiver mm-hmm. that you found um, in in supporting your daughter. Yeah, it really has taken a toll on me and it's taking me a long time to recover and I'm still recovering from it. And I don't think I'd realized, I mean, obviously, to begin with the initial shock. Yeah. Um, it it really was like grief. I've told, I've said this before. It feels exactly like the five stages of grief. Um, it does feel like losing a child um, and starting again with another one because it, it her life is is not the same. It's the same, but it's different in such a big way. Um, so there was that to get through initially, and then because you do when it's your kids right? You you want the absolute best for them. So you do what you, I stopped working really for two years and it took two years for me to learn everything I could learn about diabetes. Mm-hmm. And that's all I did. I did yeah. nothing for myself. Everything went on the back burner. I counted carbs. I noted, I noted down blood glucose levels. I wrote down every item in every meal that she had for nearly two years to see if, I, because I was so convinced that if I did it perfectly, mm-hmm. I would be able to get her into a normal blood glucose range and keep her there. And that would give her the best start in life with this condition. And it took me two years, one, to learn everything I needed to know because it's so complicated, and two, to realize that whatever I did, I was never going to be able to control it. And that was a massive emotional realization that I would have to step back and accept that she wasn't going to have normal blood sugars, whatever I did. And that was really hard to take. Um, that said, I knew that I'd done the very best I could. Uh, so I knew, I knew it wasn't possible. I knew it wasn't my failure. It just wasn't a possibility, but it kind of felt like I had to come to terms with it all over again at that point. Mm. And I had to learn to accept, um, kind of widened barriers of what health looked like. Cause I don't know how anyone else feels, but for me, I was that mum who had a baby and wanted to make everything perfect. So I was pureeing 25 yeah. different types of organic fruit and vegetables for the freezer yeah, <laughs> every, every yeah. week. I, you know, I wanted her life to be as perfect as it possibly could be. And suddenly I was not in control of that anymore. It wasn't anymore. So when you ask how it affected me at the end of that two years, I really, I, I think looking back, I'd been um, running on adrenaline. I was, I was fighting. I was just living with stress um, and at the end of that two years, when I finally took a big sigh and went, oh, OK, I can't I can't do this. I need to cut us all some slack. That's when my body really kicked in hard and said, right, you've been ignoring me. Mm. Time for me to show you that, you, that, that you, I need some attention to. And I the pain I had and I have fibromyalgia. Oh, yeah. the pain I had from fibromyalgia was so intense that I, I, well, I spent the the best part of the next couple of years backwards and forwards to doctors trying to resolve that. Um, I've had fibromyalgia for a very long time. I was just listening to your episode on fibromyalgia, actually, and pain. Um, But it was the worst I'd ever had it. And I'm I'm sure it was just my body saying, okay, it's time for us now. Mm -hmm. Um, Whereas previously, I'd, I'd been ignoring everything to do with stress for myself because it was all focused on her. Episode 113, How to Teach Our Kids to Learn with Lisa Navara. I use these as a teacher every day, but Mm -hmm. I develop these because I needed them. So, for instance, the beginning of each school year, or even when a new student just joins my class late in the year, I start off with Caring Tree, and it's really active listening. And it's something that's very easily taught to these to students. So I'll say, take out your caring tree tool and it's a visual. So Mm -hmm. that's one organic way. And then I've got my three books that support the use of the learning tools. So let's say for instance, we're in the middle of the school year and we see that, you know, there's a lot of test prep going on or even 
this, I'm not a big tester. I'm, I'm more about performance. I want to see how kids are doing every day rather than, oh, you've got a big test. Here it goes because they get stressed out. Mm-hmm. Then their executive functioning is stressed. And it's more difficult for them to be able to remember and use the information that's taught. So that's unavoidable, though, that we have standardized tests that we have to give. So we have to sometimes teach them to become familiar with the format. But these kids, second, third grade, they're feeling like, oh, my goodness, a test. And right away, they're stressed out. So what I might do is, depending on what their needs are, take out my book for Henry's Thoughts. Henry's Thoughts actually teaches children how to think positively, how to breathe. So they have what's called a calm mind for a calm body. So it's very organic. Or if you have a a student who is really in need of some support to focus, I'll say take out your focus tool. And it just makes sense. Like you ever learn something like, oh, that was so easy. If only I realized it. It's just Mm -hmm. like that for them. So they basically are paired with the verbal prompt and I explicitly teach some of these um, cognitive skills and organically support and teach them as well. So that way they, they just know when my kids read. Okay. Today I had a reading group. Typically I like them to have out their reading cue card and vowel chart and there's specific ways to use these strategies because I know if I'm working in a small group, I can help them with their focus. I can help them with positive thinking and whatnot. But there was one student who didn't take out either one of them. She took out her focus tool, true, short, true story, her focus tool and her perception tool. And I said, oh, you don't have your vowel chart out today. Are you reading a cute card? She goes, yeah, I feel like I need a better perception. <laughs> and mm-hmm. she knows what it means. Like she knows that maybe she was tired or maybe she thought the book was going to be too hard, Mm -hmm. but she had the tool flipped on the side that shows what the kids named pretty lady. She never gives up and she uses her tools where the other side is the opposite. And it was up to her to use what she needed as a visual to see. So again, it's really what they identify with and what they find supports them. Episode 114, How to Parent a Highly Sensitive Child with Melissa Schwartz. You know, one of the biggest issues for highly sensitive children is that overstimulation or over arousal. That's usually when children tend to have tantrums and pushback. And usually when parents come to me, they'll say, you know, I don't know, the smallest thing will set him or her off. You know, the um, the TV was on too loud, or I asked her to put on um, her dance leotard, or I told him to put his shoes on, and a child falls apart. And that's usually because they're already teetering on over arousal or overstimulation. What I mean when I use those words is, um, you know, if you think about like a bucket, it can only hold so much water, right? And so if if that bucket is nearly full, and then you add a few more drops to it, it will start to overflow. And so with sensitive children, very often um, the metaphorical straw that breaks them doesn't look like that big of a deal from the outside, but it's really because they've been holding so much in and they've really been holding it together for a long time that then they just tend to fall apart. And that's why that downtime for processing that, um, you know, quiet time being built into the day is really, really helpful for sensitive kids. And Another challenge that shows up there is that sensitive children usually can't tell when they're teetering on over arousal. They really need our help to identify kind of patterns in their day and look for opportunities to help them slow it down and empty out their buckets before they get too full. Because otherwise, something tiny like... um, no, we can't have pizza for dinner can be an absolute breakdown, right? And you might, as a parent, be thinking, I did everything for you today. I took you to the park and we did this and we did that and we did all these fun things. And now because I said no pizza, you're falling apart. But really it's because they were just on the edge of this overstimulation. And that one last no is what pushed them you know, into, into a breakdown. So one of the biggest challenges usually comes around this over arousal, over stimulation, not having enough time to process. But the other place where it tends to show up is around navigating emotions. 
highly sensitive children feel things in a really big way. And so when they're upset or frustrated or angry or disappointed, that can also end up in a really big tantrum. So, so you can imagine tantrums are not uncommon for highly sensitive children and not even for highly sensitive adults. You know, when, when we become adults, but we haven't really learned how to navigate our emotions, we might have our own adult tantrums where we really struggle to deal with our overstimulation, with our disappointment or upset, because if we didn't learn how to do it when we were children, we're not automatically going to have the tools for it as adults either. Episode 115, Supporting LGBTQIA plus Children and Teens with Heather Hester. I'm wondering if maybe you can share, even generally, what are some of the unique challenges that you see in terms of raising an LGBTQIA plus child or teen, um, just things that you've either come across yourself or, or from your community? Because I know you're also doing coaching as well. I am. Yes. Um, You know, I would think, I think that the most, and I've kind of touched a little bit on them, but I think that the most unique challenges really are um, that it is more difficult to find uh, the, the support and the resources that your child specifically needs um, because they're not quite as obvious yet. Um, And there's, there, on one hand, there's amazing work being done. On the other hand, there's not. So, you know, in some ways, there's some positive direction. Um, in other ways, not so much. But I, I think one of the other challenges is that you definitely have to advocate more. There are more things that you just have to kind of be aware of um, as opposed to, you know, if you were, you know, parenting a teenager or a child, adolescent, young adult um, who is not LGBTQIA, there are not, you know, there are things that you don't really have to look for or be worried about. Right. So there's this piece of, you're just on a little bit more. And um, I would also say um, learning things that are not in traditional parenting books. So kind of like I mentioned before, um, you know, there's a lot out there on, um, you know, general, you know, how to parent a typically developing teenager, right? Or a typically developing adolescent. But when you add in some of these extra layers of things that are very specific to an LGBTQIA child, it's just a little more difficult to find those, those, that information that you need, um, the help that you need. Um, So it's, it's learning to like really kind of sift through. So kind of to sum all of that up, the, the, the unique challenge comes in, finding the support and resources that you need and that your child needs. Episode 116, How to Achieve Happiness with Sean Brown. I would avoid turning the pursuit of happiness into another test to pass. That's one thing I would say. Mm. Give yourself a big dollop of grace, space, and time with something like that. And the reason why I say it is because We can turn any noble pursuit into something that then causes suffering. And with with like something like, you know, oh, I want to be happy, that can quickly turn into, why am I not happy yet? What am I doing wrong? What should I do now? What's wrong with me? Will I ever be happy? And very quickly, we can turn something that sounded like a great idea into something that then causes suffering because we're constantly like testing ourselves against this image of what we think happiness should be. Whereas... My suggestion would be allow happiness to be what it is. So rather than trying to force it to look a particular way or be a particular thing, we just notice when it's there. So it becomes more of a game of awareness rather than a game of trying to deliberately create, if that makes sense, which sounds a bit counterintuitive. But the reason I'm saying that is because when we're trying to force anything, by the very definition of it being force, 
there is resistance, there is pushing, and there is that that feel of like, oh, I've got to get to it sort of thing. And that's not really the place that's going to allow us to actually enjoy those small moments of happiness that are probably already there. And so I would say, rather than making a checklist for yourself, or rather than, you know, berating yourself because you've not been happy, just make we, we can just make an intention of, you know, from this moment forward, happiness is higher up on the list, right? It's 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 important and I recognize its importance. And so from this moment forward, I'm going to I'm going that's going to be a consideration. As well as the practicality, as well as the things we've got to do, as well as all the rest of it, happiness is in that list. Episode 117, How to Love Food and Fitness in That Order with Sam Guaz. Yeah, I've struggled in a lot of different areas with food. I've experienced times where I wasn't eating at all. I've experienced times where I was using exercise to accommodate for eating. So I was trying to exercise as much as I was eating I've tried being vegan, which was very limiting in the nutrients I was able to consume. I've tried, I had an eating disorder where I would eat a lot of food and then I would force myself to purge. I would eat foods and immediately due to like that binging and purging, I would immediately feel like anything I ate shouldn't be there. So I've struggled a lot mentally with food and my relationship with it and my relationship with my body and how it responded to food. And a lot of what I experienced was uh, obviously, you know, a mental health issue. It wasn't something that necessarily uh, was true, right? It was, a, I was living in a false reality where all, where one plus one equals, you know, whatever number I created it to be, right? Uh, I created this false reality that I was living in. And due to that false reality, I was scared of a lot of things. It forced me to think differently about myself when I was eating, when I wasn't eating. And in order to move past that, I had to create like almost uh, do the things that scared me and, and really sit with them and participate in this quote unquote experiment of, okay, if I eat this and I don't throw up, what happens? Uh, if I eat this and I go about my day, how do I feel, right? So I really actively participated in this really scary journey that um, I think a lot of people avoid doing and avoid leaning into because it goes against every part of your being that wants to look a certain way, which mm -hmm. if that's the most important thing to you, then you're not going to participate in this recovery journey because it's not important to you. And that was really a pivotal moment for me was my eating disorder and the toxic behaviors I was participating in. Um, they started to be outweighed by this strong desire to be in a loving relationship with somebody else, right? I, couldn't, I knew I couldn't do that. If I was isolating myself and, you know, basically hiding a part of me from the world because I was, you know, in eating disorder and, and really disordered eating in general, it's not something that is so openly talked about all the time, whether it's in a committed relationship with friends, uh, even sometimes just with a therapist, like it's a really embarrassing thing sometimes I think to divulge in another person. So I, if I wanted to be in a, you know, committed, loving relationship, I knew I needed to take care of myself first so that I could be proud of myself and, and feel like I wasn't being controlled by something else. Uh, I wanted to be more in control of, you know, a healthier body and mindset uh, so that I could live the life that I ultimately wanted. So that desire for that life that I wanted started to outweigh this toxic and, you know, kind of crazy lifestyle that I was living. And that was really the big transitioning point for me was realizing that other things were more important than living in this kind of eating disordered reality. 
episode 118, how to recognize if your teen needs help with Amy Schaefer Post. What are the things or maybe behaviors or kind of like what is a presentation that we should really be looking out for in terms of our teens to know when they might need either more assistance from us or from a mental health team and and assistance in that area? The biggest thing I would say is to notice changes. So we anticipate teenagers to explore and experiment. And so, you know, one day they might be, you know, goth, the next day they might be preppy. Like we expect some exploration around that. But when you see significant changes that are long lasting, so um, someone who has traditionally been very outgoing, very, um, involved with their friend group. They want to spend time with others. And now you've noticed that they're not going out with their friends as much. They're preferring to stay in their room. They're just not connecting in the same way they were before. That's a pretty significant behavioral and personality change that we want to look for and pay attention to. You know, we expect teens to have, we talk about a moody teen, right? But we, um, There should be some baseline in that moodiness. A kiddo that is always angry is most likely not a healthy young person. And so we need to look at where that anger is really coming from. Um, uh, So just looking for those, any sort of changes. And I will tell you, I think as parents, we need to do more to trust our gut. It's, it's really powerful. And if our gut says something seems wrong and something seems off, then we need to trust it and approach it. Um, there are, in addition to, to changes, I think there are other things. If you notice your, your child's having trouble maintaining friendships, and that might sound like they're best friends with someone one week and the next week, they're telling you, oh, that person, they're just awful. All they do is gossip or talk badly about others. You know, pay attention to that. Does that become a pattern that they're constantly switching friend group to friend group? Um, Do they seem to lack the ability to follow through or be persistent? I think one of the buzzwords we hear a lot these days is the idea of resilience. And um, there's a common what I think is a misnotion um, that kids are resilient. Well, that's true, sort of, (laughs) in that kids are more flexible than we are as adults. But resilience is really something that we have to nurture and um, allow a child to practice. And if a kid has struggled or if they have pushed, been pushed to their limits, they might not be able to continue to be resilient and to continue to just push through like at one point in time you thought they were able to. Uh, And certainly, you know, the obvious things of looking at those high risk behaviors. If you notice your teen is being deceitful, is um, you have, you you notice certain odors on them when, when they come home in the evening, they're not, following through with the rules, they're breaking curfew, whatever it might be. Um, If, you know, we expect teen rebellion, but if it's pretty consistent teen rebellion or there are major big concerns, you have to listen to that and address those things. Episode 119, part of the Marriage and Partnership series, When It Gets Challenging with Wendy Capewell. What about when couples get further down this line and they're they're feeling maybe that fracture, maybe there's been, you know, something even beyond just communication, maybe there's mm-hmm. like a infidelity or or some other challenge in the relationship. How do you counsel couples when they're not sure if they should keep working on it or maybe they have been working on it um, or, or if they should move on, like where, where do we even start in those conversations? I would say to start with that generally couples will seek out counseling when it's been going on for a long time and it's too late. You know, if something's been going on for five or six years and they've not done anything about it, 
you've got to unravel all of those bad habits, all of that resentment, all of that unhappiness. And it's going to take quite a long time to be able to do that. It's quite difficult if you've got set in your ways. So I think quite often, you know, I, I would recommend, you know, the couples that come to me that make a success of it, they're the ones that say, you know what, we really love each other, but there's something, something's just a bit off at the moment. So how help us get back on the track. The ones that leave it for too long, and it, there are, you know, the last chance saloon clients, but this is it. It's either this or divorce. They really trying to rekindle a situation that maybe it's just too far down the line. I'm not saying it's impossible, but it's going to be a darn sight harder to be able to get them back on track. Episode 120, Marriage and Partnership Series, Overcoming Infidelity and Inner Child Work with Ingrid Galloway. Infidelity can vary from emotional or physical or both. So not all infidelity resulting in an intercourse for someone, for example, that is not your intimate partner. So um, cases vary uh, definitely from one case to another case. And in terms of warning signs, um, uh, for example, number one, lack of time together with your partner. Yeah, so uh, why suddenly you don't have time for me? Uh, number two, lack of focus during time together. So even though you're physically together, but your partner is thinking about someone else, for example. Um, number three, lack of intimacy. Your partner suddenly becomes cold towards you because normally, uh, you know, you're hot and heavy uh, for each other, towards each other, and then suddenly, oh, you know, ice. <laughs> uh, number four, financial area doesn't add up. So money starts to go missing because they start spending money on the other person. Um, mm. Number five, keeping a lot of secrets from you. So not all the warning signs that I mentioned uh, must be leading to signs of infidelity. Not always, yeah? You have to have an open discussion with your partner to really know that, well, they are actually cheating. Episode 121, Marriage and Partnership Series, How to Be More Intimate with Dr. Alexandra Stockwell. Anyone listening may or may not be familiar with the research. There's a lot of data to point to um, so many of the challenges in the social fabric in society being the consequence of a lack of connection. So if you look at what really drives addiction, um, infidelity, lack of purpose, like alcoholism, any of the main like umbrella phenomena, meaning the general ways in which even to some degree um, financial irresponsibility, uh, the 7.5 hours that teens spend on their screens outside of educational activity, I mean, any of the ways in which our society is um, frayed, I'll say, frayed at the edges and sometimes right in the center. All of that, depending on how you ask the question, comes down to a lack of connection and an existential loneliness. So I think we are really familiar with that phenomenon in terms of the absence of connection and intimacy. My real focus is on the positives, what it actually brings. And I responded in terms of connection. You asked about intimacy. And let me just say that connection, of course, is something that you can experience with anyone, not just a spouse or someone you're going to be sexually and centrally attuned to. But I think of intimacy in this in a similar way. So maybe what I should also say is there are many kinds of intimacy. And when I have just spoken about connection, I'm really talking about what I would call emotional intimacy. 
And then, of course, there's sensual intimacy, sexual intimacy, erotic intimacy, and many other kinds of intimacy as well. But those are the ones to talk about today. So in our language, the words around the benefits that come from experiencing intimacy, we actually don't have a lot of vocabulary to describe it. So I'm going to talk about it, but you'll hear there's a lot in my intonation and like implication because we have so many more words to describe our challenges and frustrations and loneliness and suffering than we have to describe our bliss, our ecstasy, our nourishment, the exquisite experience of feeling touched and responded to in a way that has us feel heard and affirmed. Episode 122, Marriage and Partnership Series, How to Transform After Betrayal with Dr. Debbie Silber. I was just working with one of our members. We have a, a two levels of membership and at the higher level, uh, members work with me within the PPT Institute. And we were talking about how she just realized that everything she's been experiencing with her husband. Now her husband betrayed her, but so did her mom. So Mm -hmm. it was never healed from when she was a little, little kid. And so the same way of her dealing and handling and not handling is showing up now. And that's the opportunity. So we're working, you know, together so that she has the courage to completely shake things up so that they can, if it's an opportunity, rebuild something so much better. Um, but yeah, repeat betrayal is something so classic of a stage three thing where you just, it's the same, same experience, but the faces change. We also see it in relationships where um, the big wall goes up. You're like, nope. No, I'm not letting anybody get near me again. And we think that's coming from a place of strength and it's not. That's mm-hmm. coming from fear. Your heart was so broken and you are so against um, and so worried about that level of vulnerability that you'd rather it feel safer to just keep everybody out. And that's not fair to you. You know, it's like, let's say you love cooking and you get burned on the stove and you're like, never cooking again. That's not mm-hmm. fair to you. So that's how you know that's an unhealed betrayal. Uh, the, we see it in, in health, you know, where people go to the most well-meaning doctors, coaches, healers, therapists to manage a stress-related symptom, illness, condition, disease. At the root of it is an unhealed betrayal. Like, for example, 45% of everyone betrayed has a gut issue, digestive issue. You could go to the most brilliant digestive you know, gut expert, but if they don't know there's an unhealed betrayal at the root of it, you're only getting to a certain level, you see? Yeah. Um, and we see it at work too. You know, you think about it, you you deserve that raise or promotion, but your confidence was shattered in the betrayal. So you don't have the confidence to ask or you want to be a team player, collaborative partner, but the person you trusted the most proved untrustworthy. How do you trust that boss, that coworker, that partner? It shows up everywhere. Episode 123, The Parents' Survival Guide to Panda's Pans with Deborah Marcus. Why don't we get into a little bit more about that motivation to create your book and how you even set out in terms of such a large topic topic around a parent's survival guide? Well, I realized when I, um, when I reflected back on when this journey started for me, there really wasn't a lot of help out there. Um, there were some pages I, you know, Facebook was on the newer side for me. Um, there weren't a lot of people that knew about it. My pediatrician didn't know about it. So I thought to myself, um, how, if I was starting out all over again, what, what information would I want and in what format would I want it? And I felt like to provide parents with a very easy to read book that has all the information from, you know, recognizing what's going on with your child and how to get the diagnosis and figure out all the different treatment options and then go beyond that to provide the support that we often don't have. Um, And I literally, I had this idea and I just sat down one night and just started writing and writing and writing and Mm -hmm. it just kind of flowed. Um, 
And then I would go back and, and then I'd say, oh, you know, we need a chapter on this. Oh, wouldn't it be cool if I had a chapter on that? And then it just kind of continued from there. And then I spoke with another pandas mom, Melissa Nolan, and she and I met because of pandas. And she uh, has a journalism editing background. And I said, how could I make this bigger? How could I make it better? And we started meeting almost every Monday night and she would give me ideas and suggestions. And then she went on to help edit the book. Um, And she really helped me even grow it bigger from there to make sure that I was incorporating what other moms might need to read or to hear um, to, to move forward. And I felt like it really needed to be all encompassing, letting people know, giving them permission to do self-care. I think a lot of times as caregivers, we lose ourselves in this journey. Um, And when we lose ourselves, it's really hard to take care of everybody else and to take care of our relationships. So um, I really leaned on that to, to help write the book. I think that the book is different also in the sense where it has a whole chapter where children who have this illness explain what it feels like to experience Mm -hmm. these pandas and pan symptoms and the impact that it's had on their lives. And why this is important is because what is OCD to one child is not necessarily OCD to another child or a parent might not think of it as OCD. And I think reading different examples um, and hearing these children in their own words helps parents, even the parents of these children, better understand what their child is going through um, so that they can help their own child. Um, It gives a lot of practical suggestions on how to deal with things like school refusal, hygiene issues, detoxing, and and much more. I mean, a lot of things that for me, it was a trying to get this information was a lot of posting on pages and or coming across the information um, on a fa- you know on a Facebook page. Mm-hmm. But being able to have a comprehensive place where it's all together, I think makes it easier and it becomes a reference. It has a very robust resource section to help parents get more information as well as has information in it that they can share with others who don't quite get it yet. Those who are, you know, maybe a parent who doesn't quite believe the situation that's going on or doesn't quite understand it. And we need to get them on board and help them understand what this looks like. Episode 124, How to Master Change with Stephen Tuig. And so what are the tools then that we can use to approach the shadow work? That's a great question. Um, you know, as, as far as tools go, it's, it's, you know, again, it's the, it's the remind. there's a couple of things that I always say. First, understand that you're, it's your suffering that's sacred. Because if I don't have some way of seeing that I'm lying to myself, then I'm just reacting. I'm experiencing the lie and don't even know it. Does that make sense? That's like, I, I, I mm-hmm. got before me to know, for, for me to know what success is, I've got to, I've got to experience failure. It's just, it's just not, a, there's no other way for you to experience that this isn't this isn't true i am good enough i am this i am that this is not this is a lie so i've got to experience that suffering point and so anytime you find a condensed feeling uh condensed feeling would be um angry frustrated uh, scared overwhelmed um any 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 kind of a charge we call them a charge where you feel charged and it's like why do i feel just think of that person that um, just irks you. Everybody's got one, right? Mm-hmm. Just for whatever reason, every time they come in the room, they just rub you the wrong way. It's like, okay, well, the question becomes, how does that make you feel? And so the first first rule is to to go into suffering is sacred. And then the second, and we call it, I call it the primary rule of shadow work. The first rule of shadow work is that we lie to ourselves first. You think that you're, this person is making you feel this way, but they're not. You feel this way because there's a charge in you and they are then holding the space of allowing you to see where you've got an algorithm running on the bo- ba- uh, in the background that's causing you suffering. And I've ch- I found this to be true in every, I mean, I've been all around the world. I've done over 10,000 strategic interviews by working for Tony Robbins. I've been, I've been to Serbia, Australia, Canada. I've, I've been, I've been translated in seven different languages. And this is true. No matter what culture you're in, doesn't matter what side of the planet you're on. We lie to ourselves about where we're at over and over and over a series of lies. And those lies then cause us to feel a certain way. And if we don't want to feel that way about ourselves, we then project it out on the outside world so that the system that's called the mind can try to come to some kind of understanding of why I'm suffering with this lie that I'm telling myself. 
episode 126, How to Parent Through Trauma with Stephanie Dusing. Do you have any advice for parents that might be going through something similar, you know, really in terms of any diagnosis that they're trying to um, seek, be it medical, educational, learning diagnosis, things like that? So as far as resilience for parents go, it's difficult. Find your tribe. I, I reached out to help for help from anyone and everyone. I just was open about it. I'm like, I've never heard of this. We have this problem. Has anybody ever heard of this? You know, and fortunately now there are organizations that can help. You know, there are better, better Facebook groups and things like that that can help parents get connected, you know, as I mentioned. But it it is a battle. And I will tell you honestly, as I was saying earlier, although my son's form of CVI is an entirely invisible disability, most of the time you can tell. You can tell there's something wrong that these kids aren't seeing normally because they aren't looking at things. You know, I have photos of my son making eye contact, but lack of eye contact is a big thing. (laughs) And you might notice that, Mm -hmm. right? So the sad thing I think is that even now, children who very obviously have CVI, have a medical diagnosis of CVI, you know, they're still struggling. The families are still struggling to get educational and habilitative supports. It's the message hasn't gotten through to the educational community, to the habilitative community. It's very, very challenging. And this is something that parents, you will need a support system. You have to find your people and you have to rely on them because you, (laughs) it's going to be a difficult ride. I will be honest with you. The advocacy for everything, every service that your child needs, it, it's a battle still because at the time, you know, when we discovered Sebastian's CVI, his teacher of the visually impaired had never heard of it. And we know that the research shows that on average, the average TVI, more than 50% of their caseload has CVI. It's more common than ocular blindness. And so we still have this issue with teachers not having any training in what CVI is. That is fortunately getting better, but it hasn't you know, it's not, we haven't reached full capacity yet, if you know what I mean. Episode 126, How to Travel with Neurodiverse Children with Dawn Barclay. I start with starting small, and that's how to introduce the child to the concept of travel. Uh, And that can involve becoming familiar, because half of the battle is making the unfamiliar familiar since every child craves routine and predictability. So showing videos of the various aspects of the trip is really important. And whether they're provided on YouTube or sent by the travel supplier, they are available. Every aspect of that trip can be previewed in advance, Uh, as well as uh, role play, as well as um, social stories. So that's something that if people are interested, they should... um, read books by Carol Gray on how to create those customized narratives in the child's voice uh, to many experiences. So I, I talk about instead of going on a camping trip, first off, why not set up a tent in the backyard first and have the child experience one night and see where the triggers lie before you spend thousands on a hotel stay, maybe stay at a friend's house for a night or a relative and see what it's like for the child to sleep in a bedroom that's not his or her own. So you'll see where the triggers are, whether it's that they need the blankets and sheets from home with the familiar smell and texture, same thing with toiletries, uh, whether they need a nightlight like they have at home or a fan to drown out noise from the hallway uh, or anything to make the room feel more like what they're used to at home. So I talk about a lot of those mini experiences as well. That makes a lot of sense in terms of all of those little things that you don't as an adult necessarily think of, or, you know, if you're not um, requiring those things as a parent, you don't think of it for your child necessarily. So that's a really good way to look at it. Yeah, I try to think of the book as a checklist of anything you might have to think about in advance, and it's broken up by... um, mode of transportation and then type of facility you may stay in and then what to do when you get there. So whatever you're planning to do, I don't expect that anybody's going to read this book cover to cover, but they're going to read 
the sections that pertain to whatever the trip is this time. And, and hopefully it'll give them a checklist of, of what to do and what to think about. Yeah, that makes sense. And you mentioned modes and I was interested in that. Are there specific modes of travel that are easier for neurodiverse children and their families versus other like, so, you know, is car versus plane is a cruise or I mean, a resort isn't exactly a mode, but um, you mentioned camping, like, are there certain things that you've kind of looked at and you think that would be an easier? You know, again, because it's a spectrum. And that's why autism spectrum right. disorder, it's a spectrum, every child's different. So it's going to depend on that child. For some people, Air, airline travel is going to be, uh, you know, really something they fear. For another family, their child might live and breathe airplanes. And so the, the airplane is right. going to be the highlight. Like a safe space. So yeah. that's why, yeah, I mean, I think that road trips are really great to start with. First of all, you're in charge. You can figure out how long or short that trip's going to be. You can decide where the stops are going to be. And it's pretty easy to plan to make sure that you're going to stop at a certain playground or certain parks on the way or something that the child might be particularly interested in, like a special interest museum. You can schedule and structure that road trip to take advantage of all of that. And you can also do the driving when the child's sleeping, if that will work out better. Um, and it also gives you a lot more room in the car for whatever you might need, because you might need to bring a lot of different things, whether it's special foods for the child, if they don't eat, uh, if they're finicky eaters and, and they'll only eat what you bring from home, you're going to want to carry it with you. And you're going to want to make sure that there are supermarkets along the way that might carry what you want to bring. Um, so I, I think that a road trip's a really good way to start. There's some children who love trains. In fact, a lot of children on the spectrum absolutely adore trains. Uh, so that might be a short trip on a train before you book a longer one. Again, it's, it, you know, for me, I loved cruising. Uh, and the beauty of cruising is that the cruises are different lengths, um, different size ships and different destinations. So you can really structure what you want. Um and while the people in the book really varied whether they believed that you should go on a law, uh, you know, a really large ship, like one of these three to five thousand person ships versus a really small ship, um, you can pick what will work for you. The uh, the travel advisors who went for the bigger ships pointed out that because it's so large and there's so much going on, you'll generally get smaller groups in each activity. Um, and there'll be so much offer that there's always going to be something for everyone. Plus the, um, the kids clubs on the major cruise lines have all been trained on how to work with a kids on the spectrum. So you can feel comfortable leaving your child there. How to be a conscious parent with Nina Cruz. There's no punishment like fear-based strategies. A lot of the fear-based punishments and strategies uh, actually disconnect you from the child, which means they don't want to be telling you the truth. Mm -hmm. And it actually doesn't work in your favour. They they won't be able to come to you openly when they've messed up really bad. They're scared. They're going to get punished. They're going to take something away. And they're also not reflecting on really what they they did necessarily and feeling the feelings. They just get scared. So they're not feeling necessarily that, oh, that really you know, the impact of what their action, they did their actions. So, um, you know, we have certainly have boundaries and like loving limits and consequences. So, you know, if, if uh, you know, they did something at school and they obviously, school takes care of that, you, you can't really do much about that depending on what school they're at. There's going to be consequences at school. Um, but you want to really have an open dialogue. You want to be connecting first. You want to be hearing their story, understanding. And as you understand what's going on, because with conscious parenting, it's really you become quite creative and you 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 actually tap into a whole new, you know, new world of possibilities because you can't rely on the go-to that naturally your ego wants to shut it down or wants to, to, to control or, or punish. So you, you get creative. Uh, so the, the prerequisite is that the consequence needs to be related, like closely related to the, the incident. And obviously, um, 
you know, it can't be like a week later or it can't be, you know, it's in the moment that, that you're dealing with it. So, you know, if something happens at school, you, they come back. Um, they've already been probably reprimanded at school. You have a conversation with them. You understand what's going on. You get on their level. Uh, and then you, you, you take action from there, you know, uh, depending on, do you have an example like at school, like what might happen? Like, I don't have a specific example, but yeah, I mean, I'm just kind of reflecting on, you know, maybe, maybe they didn't try very hard on something, right? So they okay. decided sure. that they don't like something at school and they just didn't do it or something like that. Yeah. Um, and yeah. so like, there's almost that motivation piece too, right? And so then they come home and the consequence, you're right at school, like would have been, I didn't do well on this. And yeah, no, they got a bad of, mark. You know, they got a yeah. low mark maybe. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. so maybe they're not even caring that much. And so how do you have that conversation? And, you know, I know you talked about children kind of being in, and doing things that they want, but like, yeah, how do you motivate them in in that case? Or yeah, well, you want you want intrinsic motivation. You want them to you want it coming from. A lot of this work is from the inside out. We we conditioned to go from the outside in. That everything is the outside, and then so we want to be building from the inside out because that's that's where the the true motivation, the true desire comes from. Um, you know, and they come back. Um, you know, and they. They didn't maybe try and they, you know, you have a conversation about that. Like uh, anybody that's punished or, you know, that that really is not going to motivate them to try more. They they want to, you know, maybe it's payback or they, they don't really care about it. But you, you would have a conversation, understand what happened. If they're not organised and they need more organisation, you come up with a plan with them, some kind of agreement to to plan, you know, studying or, or getting a bit more organised. Um, and you find out what what would they like? What what do they you know? Whether it's a, a subject, you know, what do they like about this subject? You've you've got to start to investigate. You become, you know, you know, an investigator really, and you're understanding what your child is. That might not be their subject. They really might, you know, depending on what it is. Obviously, you've got to find out what what uh, gets them going, what motivates them. Um, and that's that's why it's it's not a you know a strategy or a, you know a one fit you know one fit model one size fits all model because every child is unique and every you know child has their own temperament their own um, blueprint kind of their own uh, way of being and that's that's what we want to connect with we want to understand first and then support them and be their guide. Uh, you know, if you're looking at, you know, they, they don't do the right thing with screens, say, you know, you have a plan with screens, you you talk to them about, you know, they maybe played more, you know, went over the time that was allocated, you know, with, with my son, if if he goes, goes over, uh, we discuss the plan for the next time, and he will tell me, you just take 15 minutes off my next time, he'll tell me that I'm not telling him. So you come up with a plan that that works for both of you. Uh, mm -hmm. In particular, with screens, you have to be regulating. Like children can't regulate their time on screens, um, so it's really it, the the child. The, the main, you know, premise is that you know everybody wants to be seen, heard, understood. Do I matter? And this is the basic lens we're coming from. They feel heard. They feel seen. They they matter. That we're not coming down from a top down approach telling them what to do, shuffling them in and out of the place, um, you know, nagging, uh, you know, they're constantly told they're not doing this, they're not doing that, you know, like we we hear ourselves doing it and we're like, oh, God, here I go again, you know. Mm -hmm. um, we we are creating and and allowing this unfolding of a beautiful connective relationship uh, that that is going to have its ups and downs, is going to have its challenges, but we're creating in the core of it this 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 uh, connective piece where they feel they feel that at a deep level and we feel that. We're seeing ourselves now. We're understanding ourselves. We're listening to ourselves uh, and we're modelling it, really. Episode 128, How to Start Over with L. Hart. 
What do you think has been the biggest obstacle during this time of change and kind of completely changing your life and starting over? Yeah, my biggest obstacle is when I drop into those bottom strengths. And the funny thing is, is that was happening before I even had taken the assessment and knew what my strengths were. Mm. I I don't do well when I when I go backwards and I think about the past. Um, and when those voices of the past keep coming up and and I hear the negative things that were told to me for so many years, that's a huge obstacle for me. I have to, you know, be very mindful of you know, putting a stop to that. And then when I overthink things, that does not serve me well either. Or when I get caught up in my my accomplishments and my measurements and, you know, all the, the statistics and numbers that go with people, mm-hmm. um, those are big obstacles for me as well. And the main one is comparing myself to other people. Mm-hmm. So I noticed that You know, like I said, even before I had taken this assessment and understand it now to this level, when I was doing those things, when I was going through all the changes and I compared myself to all my friends and how come their marriages could last and mine can't and that type of thing, those were huge obstacles for me to have to overcome. But being mindful and understanding the way that you feel when those things are happening and process through those feelings that helps get you into listening and getting back in touch with, but wait a minute, this feels better for me. So, hey, if that feels better, maybe I should lean more into those things then instead, because who doesn't want to feel good? (laughs) Episode 130, how to tackle the holidays and winter blahs with Miranda Barker. And I wondered if you had any advice specifically for parents. I know so many parents are managing lots of demands during this time, be it, you know, the gift giving side of things or preparing the house or maybe managing um, older parents uh, and different things like that. So there's a lot going on. And how can they manage all of those demands and come out, you know, not maybe feeling frazzled at the end of the season? Oh my gosh, I think so many people can relate to this question. Mm -hmm. Um, Whenever I think about demands, I think about expectations. I think about where are my expectations for myself or my family or what I can commit to this time of year. And and even like where are my partner's expectations and my family's (laughs) expectations. And I think that sometimes all of those expectations combined can can feel so demanding and feel like we have to be doing everything. And mm-hmm. this is really the time of year that we need to be over communicators, you know, and talking to, if you're in a partnership, talking to them, whose side, whose side of the family are we going to be with on Christmas or on this holiday or how long are we going to be there? And, and talking to those family members and, um, and over communicating those boundaries and, and those plans, because these are the things that we need to be communicating so that, we're setting other expectations and, and taking some of that demand off of off of ourselves. But, you know, as I was thinking about this question, too, I was thinking about how for parents, there are so many things you could be doing with your child this time of year. Mm-hmm. And it's so easy to compare ourselves to, you know, the mom that hand glued a felt advent calendar together and had like amazing activities for their child to do every day, you know, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Not that I'm thinking of anyone in particular, but (laughs) I, I think it's so easy to, to get swept up in, in this, this need to make, to make this the most magical time of year or to, to do certain things so that your child has the best possible holiday season. And, um, and then I, for the parents that feel that way or that that feel all of those demands, I I usually will say like, why don't you spend some time reflecting on your own childhood? Reflect on what important traditions you remember or that you cherish from from growing up. And you know, if there's ones that you want to carry over and and even just thinking about like what do I remember about these holidays, what was important to me? Because I think that that puts some perspective in in some people. Just it helps them remember that you know it doesn't have to be over the top. It doesn't have to be, 
you know, like you don't have to get all of the all of the gifts that your child could possibly want, because in reality, you know, like that's that's not always what what's best for our child. And it's not necessarily what's needed, too. But I want parents who are listening to this to think about what you want your child to cherish and remember about this time. And like um, one of my favorite memories from my childhood and uh, in this time of year was just driving around with hot cocoa, looking at lights displays. And, you know, it's, it's free. It's, it's something that's small. And, and that was just a, an important tradition in my family. And so I think that whatever it is for you, you know, figure out what's important to you this time of year, communicate those expectations with your partner, your extended family, chosen family, et cetera. And then give yourself some grace to let go of the rest of those demands or expectations. Yes, no, absolutely. You're right. There are so many things that just kind of keep coming at you. And you're right. The social media piece is definitely one that like, then you see, oh, they went to this Christmas market last weekend. Right? or Oh, mm-hmm. wow, they cut their own Christmas tree or, you know, and it just starts to become this like, am I not doing this right feeling? Yes. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, and you're right. It's It's not all of those things that are remembered in the end. So that's a great perspective to kind of keep. Thank you so much to all the wonderful guests that participated throughout 2022 on the Learning to Slay the Beast podcast. I'm so grateful and so happy to to have been able to connect with everybody this year and share a lot of powerful stories and a lot of great tips and learnings from different practitioners and parents and others throughout the community. I hope that everyone has found this year's worth of episodes to be useful please feel free to share them if there is one or two or all of them that you've enjoyed. Uh, Please share those with others because then we get to the message of all of these wonderful guests out there that have contributed their time and energy to the podcast. It's so much appreciated. Also, I was thinking one thing that I will do is put the top 10 from 2022 of the top 10 listened episodes of the podcast into the show notes so that you can see those and find them if you are looking for them. I hope that everybody has had a wonderful 2022. I'm sure if you're anything like me, it's been all over the place, lots of ups, lots of downs, lots of in-between, and I hope that the end of this year is feeling good and that we can all really focus on what can be anew within 2023 and where our lives can go. Also, again, I say this all the time, but if you have ideas for guests or topics that you'd be interested to hear, I am definitely taking some time over the holidays to put together ideas for 2023, and I would love to hear from you through Instagram. It's at Sarah, S-A-R-A, Lady, L-A-D-Y, Gluten, G-L-U-T-E-N on Instagram, or you can email me at Co at gmail.com if you have ideas for shows or even if you want to be a guest yourself and let me know what you think would be great to hear more about on the Learning to Slay the Beast podcast. So I do hope that everybody has a safe end to 2022. Looking forward to some episodes that I already have recorded for 2023 and we will start that within a couple of weeks. Thanks so much for listening and making it through this very long episode um, of some of the best clips that we've had throughout the year of 2022. Have a great holiday season. Thanks. Thank you for listening to the Learning to Slay the Beast podcast. Please keep in mind, this podcast is not intended to be medical or professional advice. If you'd like to hear more from me, you can follow me on social media, Instagram and TikTok at Sarah Lady Gluten or Facebook, Sarah underscore Gluten Free Lady. You can also visit my website, which includes author information, speaking information, and more info on the podcast at www.se-german.com. If you like the podcast, please feel free to review the podcast on your favorite platform and also subscribe because it means that it will show up for you every week on your favorite podcast platform. Also, we've just started to have the ability to support the podcast. You can find this link in my Instagram bio or visit Kofi, 
ko-fi.com slash learning to slay the beasts. Thanks again for listening and have a great week.